Should we start? Sure thing. Okay, so welcome everyone. So nice to see you all. Um, we will start with introductions, although we know each other by this time already, many of us, but let's do it because I think there are some new people here. Uh, why don't you try to turn on your camera so we can see you? And let's see how we can start. I'll start how my computer goes. How my So Mary, can you introduce yourself? Hi, Mary Ardones. Um, I'm from Mountain Pacific. I'll be your IT support and I'm at the Hawaii office. Thank you. Amber? Amber Rogers with Mountain Pacific and um, I'm in lovely Missoula, Montana. Thank you. Megan? Oh, there it goes. Um, my name is Megan Fallon. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Billings, and I am a perinatal specialist. Uh, and this is Emma. She's homesick today, so she's going to join us. Hopefully, it's not too disruptive. Um, I am a PMAD survivor myself with this little one and have just really enjoyed being part of these calls. So thank you. Thank you. And welcome, Emma. <laughs> Cassie? Hi, I'm Cassie. I'm a nurse practitioner graduate student and I'm in Missoula, Montana. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Betty? Hi, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Northern California, about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. So um, I had a call for, from a lady this morning, actually, that had a miscarriage, and I'm looking forward to being able to ask about that. So nice to That's be here. Great. Thank you. Great. Bree? Hi, everybody. Bree McLaurin from Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Beth Upson, and I work for Montana DPHHS, and I'm in the um, Helena office. I oversee um, a HRSA grant that helps to fund the Prism for Moms line and our Meadowlark initiative in the state. Thank you. Nath? Um, hi, everyone. I'm in Billings, and I'm the counselor at the Midwifery and Women's Center here in Billings. Great. Welcome. Laura? Hi, I'm Laura Weatherelt. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Miles City. Um, nice to see everybody. Welcome. Kelsey? Kelsey, can you hear me? I think you muted, unmuted, and then remuted yourself. So um, I believe you are presenting a case today as well. Hey, I. Uh oh, I think she might have a little bit unstable uh, connection there. She'll probably pop on later. I see. Okay. So welcome, Chelsea. I hope we can get to hear you later. Okay. So, can, oh. Maybe you want to get out and get in again. Okay, so, okay, so today we are going to talk about bipolar disorder. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. 
Okay. So we'll talk about bipolar disorder during the perinatal period. So before we start, let me see one thing. Before we start, I wanted to ask if anyone wants to say something, any announcement, anything, anyone has some? anything to say. We will discuss cases at the end, but for now, if anyone has any announcement, no? Okay. Is this the last session? No, we okay. have, this is the seventh session. There are three more. Okay. So some of you may be a little bit confused because it is, the, if you're registered for both of our 3D echoes, this is the last session of the substance use disorder echo. Um, at three o'clock today, but we do have um, a few more planned here for the prism. Yeah. Okay. So bipolar disorder. Yeah, I have an announcement. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So I work um, um, in support of the prism line, supporting um, Ariella with community-based referrals and. Um, also do a lot of work around training in this um, subject. And I just wanted to promote our conference. I will put a link in the um, chat. There's a lot of scholarships available. So if um, funding is at all a factor besides just time, um, please reach out. It's gonna be awesome. Um, one, of the, one of the lead um, one of the, the lead um, presenters on the first day, she runs the Child Development Center out, out of Yale, and she's going to talk all about the neurodevelopment of parenthood. It's going to be incredible. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. Um, and then the second announcement is that my team has been collecting community-based resources and, and family-friendly events. Um, family friendly events that are substance and alcohol free and we're putting them all on this great website um, here this week, next week and I'm putting out a magazine that's gonna be telling stories called Lips. We're gonna send it out to all of the birthing hospitals, WIC clinics and some other locations across the state. So um, it'll also be available online. So I'll send out more information once that's gone live, but. I just hope you guys will use it and I hope it's helpful and I hope um, we can get some feedback about like, I know it's not gonna be perfect, it's the first time. Um, so let's just continue to share resources and keep growing this list. And um, again, I really hope you'll come to the conference and if, you'd let, if you need a, a scholarship, please, please request one. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Bray. Okay, so bipolar disorder. It's very challenging to treat it in pregnancy and postpartum, and we'll talk why it is associated with lower fertility rates, there is strong genetic loading, and there is the issue of that some of the medications that we use to treat it can have teratogenic effects. So we'll talk more about medications today. And what happens if we stop the medication, there is high risk of recurrence of the illness. So we'll talk about that too. And there is a high risk of relapse in the postpartum period, uh, primarily. And it is associated with postpartum psychosis. I don't know if you remember, we spoke last week, I think, about post and two weeks ago about postpartum psychosis. It has a prevalence of 10 to 20%, and it's associated with high rates of suicide and infanticide. So it's very important to keep an eye on these women. So women with bipolar disorder are at high risk for relapse during and after pregnancy. And I will show you a study about that in a little bit. And uh, especially in the postpartum period, they can have a rapid onset of symptoms. And you should, it, it can happen that symptoms can be accompan uh, accompanied by psychotic features. So it can be very severe. And sometimes it happens that when you see a woman with postpartum psychosis, that's the first manifestation of a bipolar disorder. So you might not know that that woman has a history of bipolar disorder or any mental illness until she comes with a postpartum psychosis episode. 
and that's how they develop their bipolar disorder. So perinatal bipolar disorder is underdiagnosed, and that happens because a lot of women present with depression, so they are diagnosed just with depression. Um, that what happens that the most common presentation is a depressive episode, uh, mostly during pregnancy and also in the postpartum actually. And that's why you think it's just depression. And having mood changes during pregnancy is the biggest predictor of postpartum episode. So it's very important to screen these women uh, when they come for care. And they did a study of women with bipolar one and bipolar two, and they saw that 23% had illness during pregnancy and 52% had an episode of illness during the postpartum period. And they saw that the perinatal episode of, the, of bipolar disorder can be complicated by different things. So what can happen when a woman comes with depression or mania or psychosis during pregnancy or postpartum, they might not participate in prenatal care, they might have insomnia, substance abuse, they might not bond with the baby, and that can happen during pregnancy, they might not bond with the pregnancy, but also after the baby is born, they might not bond with the baby. They might have inability to care for the infant, they might have obsessions regarding the baby, uh, sometimes the obsessions are about harming the baby. Then they can be psychotic, having delusions, hallucinations, or as I said before, before having suicide ideation or infanticide ideation. So it's very important to screen. And we usually screen every woman with a depression screening tool that can be like the EPDS. And then what is important is the women that are positive in the EPDS is to screen with something like the MDQ. And why is that? Because some of these women that screen positive for depression that can actually have bipolar disorder and that will change the treatment, what we use for treatment. And in this study that I show here, 21.4% of the patients who screen positive for depressive symptoms on the APDS also screen positive for bipolar disorder on the MDQ. So that makes us think how important it is to screen for bipolar disorder in women with depression. So here is the APDS. So when we I showed, I feel I showed it to you several times already. It's a 10 item questionnaire, self-administered, and the last question is about suicide and it, it's validated in pregnancy and in the postpartum. And it's very easy to use. And this is the MDQ, which is validated in the postpartum, but it's not really validated in pregnancy, but we use it in pregnancy too. And it's also self-administered and it's very easy to use too. So both of them should be given to women that, that score positive for the, uh, depression or you think are depressed. So it's very important that women feel well in pregnancy to improve the outcomes of the pregnancy. And what I always discuss with women and in particular with women with bipolar disorder and that is that no decision is going to be risk-free. There is always going to be a risk of illness and there is always going to be a risk of medication or treatment. And you always need to do an individualized risk benefit assessment. It's not uh, enough to say this medication is safe because you read that it is the safest in, safest in pregnancy. You need to see if that medication is the safest for, for that particular patient. And you're always going to use medication with more reproductive safety data, not because the medication is new and we don't know a lot about and seems to be safe. It means that it's safe. It's better to use the ones that have been around for a longer time even if they have some negative effects, but we know what those negative effects are than to use something that we don't know about. And always it's good to simplify medication regimens. So usually patients sometimes come with three, four, five medications. I usually try, if possible, 
to decrease the amount of medication to the least amount possible. So as I said, you always discuss the risk of illness versus the risk of the benefits of the treatment. This is very important. Patients don't think about the risk of illness. They just think about the risk of the treatment. And when you talk to them about what is the risk of the illness, that's when they realize that they have to pay attention to that. You will encourage participation in prenatal care and avoid substance abuse and other unhealthy habits. You always will try to involve somebody from the family or a significant other, somebody, a caregiver, because what will happen in times when the woman is not doing well, you need somebody to help you to first realize if the woman is not doing well and call you, and second, to be able to help this woman when she has a baby and she's not doing well. You will always want to discuss the goals of treatment because you want the woman to make decisions now that she's doing well when she comes, if she's euphemic and she's doing well, because later on she might not be able to make decision, decisions. So you want to know what are her decisions uh, before time. And you always will talk to them about reducing any stressors and you will discuss treatment options and you will always discuss about psychotherapies and medications and if needed in certain situations, ECT. So what are the risks of bipolar disorder in the pregnancy? And they, this is a large population-based cohort study and in Sweden, where they have a lot of information about their population, and they compared women with untreated bipolar and another group of treated bipolar during pregnancy, and they compared them to a control group of women without bipolar disorder. And they saw that women with bipolar disorder, whether treated or not, were more often smokers, overweight, and misuse alcohol and substances. And both the treated and untreated women had an increased risk of C-section, instrumental delivery, and non-spontaneous start to delivery and preterm delivery. But the untreated bipolar disorder was also associated with small for gestational age, microcephaly, and hypoglycemia. So here you see some of the negative effects and the risks of being not treated for bipolar disorder. So this is a very important study that I always that I speak about bipolar disorder. I always mention it. There are some studies that are retrospective and talk about um, the risk of having a recurrence of bipolar disorder in pregnancy. But this one was the first prospective study and they actually gave the women the choice. They wanted to continue or stop their medications. But what they saw in the study is that nevertheless, if they chose to continue or stop the medication, 70% of the sample of the women had at least one episode of illness during their pregnancy. But the recurrence risk was 2.3 times greater after stopping the mood stabilizer treatment. And that women who stopped the mood stabilizer uh, treatment spent over 40% of their pregnancy in a mood episode, compared to 8% of the women who continue their medication. And also the women who discontinue the mood stabilizer abruptly had 50% risk of recurrence within two weeks versus 22 weeks in women who gradually taper their mood stabilizer. This is so important because it shows us that most of the women will have an episode even if they are on medication, but the women that stop it abruptly have a higher chance of having an episode immediately. And also that the women that stop their medication have a higher chance of having a, a bigger episode in terms of time um, in their pregnancy compared to women that continue their medication. So this was also seen in this study. What were the predictors of recurrence? So first, stopping the mood stabilizer was one, younger onset of illness, more years on having the illness, more recurrences in their life, history of rapid cycling, history of suicidal attempts, and presence of comorbid disorders and use of antidepressants. 
and the use of antidepressants and treatment discontinuation were both independent risk factors uh, for recurrence, which is very interesting, even after adjusting for illness severity. So with what I'm trying to tell you is that it's so important to treat these women and make sure they are feeling well during pregnancy to avoid a episode in pregnancy and in the postpartum. So what are the medications we use to treat a bipolar disorder? We use antipsychotics and we use mood stabilizers. So we'll start with a medication that is, kind of, is the gold standard of um, of the treatment of bipolar disorder, that is lithium. What happens with lithium in pregnancy? So in the 70s, there was a voluntary physician uh, registry, it was a reporting database, and they saw that there was a 400 higher rate of cardiovascular malformation, particularly one that is collapsed anomaly, that is a very severe one, but usually it happens one in 20,000 in the general population. So they saw a 400 for higher rate in, patient, in babies exposed to lithium during pregnancy. In the early 90s, they revised this increased risk and they saw that actually the risk wasn't as much, but there was some risk. So uh, they saw that the risk was one in 1,000 to two in 1,000. What is very reassuring, reassuring, there was a recent prospective study from Israel that showed that there was no association between lithium in the first trimester and increased risk of cardiovascular malformations when they took away the anomalies that uh, resolve spontaneously, because there are some anomalies that resolve spontaneously in babies. So, this is very reassuring. And actually lithium is a medication that we use in pregnancy because the risk is not as bad as we thought. And when we put it in a balance and compare risk of illness with risk of medication, the risk of illness for some women is higher than the risk of medication. But lithium can also have complications later on and babies can be born with sedation, floppy infant syndrome, that means having poor tone and cyanosis. They can have polyhydramnios, preterm birth, high liver anemia, cardiac problems, hypothyroidism, diabetes insipidus, and there is not much data on long-term effects. So what is also very interesting is, initially they said, you can't breastfeed when you take lithium. And lately, there have been some studies about um, using lithium during breastfeeding. And this is a small study of 10 mother infant pairs. And they obtained essays from lithium in maternal serum, breast milk, and infant serum. And they checked the thyroid and renal function on the infant. And they saw that lithium concentrations in the infant serum, breast milk, and maternal serum, they were like half of like, so if the maternal serum was at one level, it was half in breast milk and half in infant serum. Um, so serum lithium levels in infants were low and well tolerated. And there were some babies that had a, an elevation on a thyroid a hormone and the UN and creatinine, but it, it was transient and didn't have a clinical significance. So lithium in breastfeeding should be considered in selected women. It's not for every woman. So the mom has to be stable. You usually have to have lithium as just the only medication or a very simple medication regimen. They have to adhere to the infant monitoring recommendations. The baby has to be healthy and you have to have a pediatrician that is on board. And so what is the management of lithium in terms of when you have a patient that is pregnant and uh, comes to you using lithium? So you need to control her, like check the levels monthly, 
or more frequently if there are any obstetric complications. And in the last month, we usually check levels weekly. And you need to adjust the dose as the pregnancy progresses uh, sometimes. And you need to do a high resolution ultrasound and set an echocardiography in week 16 to 18 because of the cardiovascular anomalies that I told you. And usually what we do is we check lithium levels at delivery and we make sure the patient is well hydrated during delivery. And there are some controversy in terms of what to do, but the conser more conservative view is that you reduce lithium dose by 50% uh, uh, before, before delivery and also after delivery. And uh, you check lithium level after delivery 24 hours and after each dose adjustment. So initially they say that you have to hold the lithium when a patient came for a C-section or started with labor. Now there is some controversy about that and they say you have to decrease the dose, but um, yes, you have to decrease the dose following delivery. So in terms of antipsychotics, we have two kinds of antipsychotics, the typicals and the atypicals. The typicals are the ones that have been around for a longer time. These are the ones like haloperidol, tofenacin, clopromacin, and there is more data about them because they have been around for a longer time. And there is here a prospective cohort study, and they saw no increased rate of congenital malformations in in fetal death and neonatal death when they compare them with non-exposed control pregnancy. And they know the high potency antipsychotic usually are less teratogenic than the low potency. High potency is Haldol. So that's why you will see a lot of use of Haldol uh, with, uh, in patients that are pregnant. There are some cases of EPS. EPS is extra pyramidal symptoms in the newborn. And these can be like tremors or what we call dystonia. So being rigid, the baby, and it can be very distressing for the woman to see, and it, but it's transitory, but it can last a few months. So it's important to tell patients it's not very common, but it can happen. In terms of the atypical antipsychotics, the that's are the more the newer ones like Risperdal, Cyprexa, Olanzapine, Aripiprazole, Abilify, Seroquel, Ketiapine, uh, geodon, ziprasidon, there is no increased rate of congenital malformations. And this is a big study that I put here, a Medicaid study of more, more than a million women. And there was no significant increased risk of malformation after controlling for potential confounding with the exception of risperidone, but still the association with risperidone was small and might have been by chance. And what they saw, it's a risk of poor adaptation syndrome, that that what it means that when the baby is born for a few days, the baby can have poor sleep, poor feeding, uh, breathe a little faster, be colicky, irritable, but it should go away. And there is insufficient data in terms of long-term effects. I should say from the atypical antipsychotics, the one that I use the most, I, I use, many of them, but the one that passes less the placenta is ketiapine or seroquel. So it has been used more in pregnancy. In terms of breastfeeding, so the typical ones, the old ones have low amounts in milk and the newer ones, we have fewer data, but it seems to have low expression into breast milk. There is one atypical antipsychotic that is called clozapine that is used for very severe women. And it seems to be higher in, in infant serum concentrations and in breast milk. And we avoid it because there is a risk of a severe uh, complication that is called agranulocytosis. And there is that potential risk. So we try to avoid it in breastfeeding. In terms, we also use the anticonvulsants for as mood stabilizers. And those are the ones like we use uh, instead of lithium. So like uh, 
valproic acid or depapod or carbamazepine or teguetol. But the problem with this one is that compared to lithium, they have so much higher risk of malformations. And valproic acid or depapod has up to 10% of risk of malformation. So valproic acid actually is contraindicated in pregnancy in some countries and should be contraindicated. Also, valproic acid, it's not just the first trimester, but there are studies that show that it can have long-term neurobehavioral effects in children exposed across all the trimesters. So there are children with autism, children with lower IQ, children with behavioral problems, and so it's a cognitive problem. So it's very important to avoid valproic acid in pregnancy. In terms of lamotrigine, most of the data regarding its use as monotherapy has uh, shown uh, has not shown an increase in risk of malformation, so it's very reassuring. And the long-term effect that is limited but reassuring. So this is a possibility. The thing is, this medication you can't. It doesn't work for every bipolar patient. So you have to use it for the patients that it will work. So it's not good for mania, let's say. It's better for depression. So um, that's one of the issues with it. But it's a very good medication to use in pregnancy. So valproic acid and carbamazepine supposedly are compatible with breastfeeding by the American Academy of Pediatrics. But it has been shown hepatic toxicity with both of them. And lamotrigine needs to use with caution because it accumulates in breast milk, but there are more and more cases of women that breastfeed with lamotrigine and it, it seems to be okay. Lithium, I spoke to you about it. Here it says that you, its use is discouraged due to adverse effects, but now new studies suggest that this uh, effects are not so common. So uh, in certain situations, I, as I explained, you can use it. And in these kind of women that use mood stabilizers during breastfeeding, you need to check the levels in the baby. Okay. So I just wanted to mention our referral line, the prison psychiatric consultation line. If you have any patients that you want to refer in terms of like discuss with us, please call us. We are here to help you. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions before we discuss a case about bipolar disorder, we can discuss now. And we have a case that Chelsea submitted. So we are going to discuss that case. I had one question. Yes. When it says recurrent of bipolar, does that either manic or depressive symptoms? You mean in pregnancy? When it says like, yeah, recurrence of bipolar symptoms so, in pregnancy, is that either manic or depressive? So in pregnancy, it's more common to have a, a depressive or a dysphoric kind of um, recurrence. In the postpartum, it can be either depression or can be a manic psychotic episode. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so let's discuss the case. Chelsea, do you want to? Yes, can you hear me okay? Perfect, perfect. Okay, good, we had to switch around our internet stuff. And I got to get rid of our background so you guys can actually see Chelsea. Oh, there oh, we go. Okay, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. So I'm Chelsea. Um, we're in, Dr. Marshawn and I are in Lewistown at Central Montana Medical Center. And the case that we have had has been um, a patient of ours that we have taken care of together as a doctor and nurse for a really long time. Um, it was a patient that, um, was with her first pregnancy in 2015, um, delivered, um, her delivery was complicated by preeclampsia, but after delivery, um, the baby died, um, of sudden infant death syndrome at one week, um, was in the dad's arms in a recliner. Um, so following that, um, we've been care of this patient a lot. 
um, for, you know, various things. But um, in the course of that, um, she's been in um, a lot with, she's been trying to conceive um, diagnosis of some PCOS um, in that process. Um, she also had Asherman. So um, five weeks after her delivery, she came into the ER hemorrhaging and had uh, a small retained placenta, had the most difficult DNC I've had in probably 15, 20 years um, and had so much scar tissue from the amount that was there um, that she had to get it um, scraped out twice by the fertility specialist. Um, and she also has PCOS. It took her like two years to conceive that child, which she conceived spontaneously. Um, I think she might have been on spironolactone or something else with it. But um, and so it's been a huge fertility battle, lots of medical bills, um, lots of guilt and shame between, you know, the father um, and then not being able to conceive. And then um, I'll let Chelsea continue on with the rest. Yeah. And then, I mean, just pop in because I'm kind of might be all over the place too, but um, in the middle of it, she has, she comes in a lot for just little things. I would say abdominal pain, IBS, odd things like a numb here, um, lots of, um, you know, things. Um, and then just um, barriers to in her treatment over the past year with anxiety and depression. Uh, we have a hard time treating that with her um, cause we've had her in counseling, um, and therapy and then she'll, she'll go and then stop going. Um, you had her on fluoxetine and she was on citalopram for a while, which helped and then switched to fluoxetine, but she, she, there's, she just won't take it. So like she, she'll, and you, you don't find out things till later. Um, like as you're digging through a little, like she like she's had she is pregnant now she's at 10 weeks um with a spontaneous conception and has pretty she has hyperemesis enough where she can keep stuff down but she's tired all the time she's a foster parent her and her husband are foster parents in di very difficult cases some of which were friends of hers and then others that are from other towns um and like some of her symptoms I was like oh is she getting serotonin withdrawal and then then you find out she was only taking her fluoxetine like once a week if she was lucky and she didn't even know that her husband had to be like well I counted your pills and so like each each thing we try to help her find solutions she'll set up barriers for why she had a miscarriage uh, about a year ago um, she had subclinical hypothyroidism. We started on levothyroxine and doubled her dose or went up by 25% when she got pregnant, but she wouldn't take it because she was too nauseous, but didn't tell us. And like in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, did that contribute her? She had genetic testing on the baby. The baby was totally normal. So there's all these barriers. And I think it's frustrating for us too, because we were there when her child died. We were there when her, when she had the preeclampsia where we take care of all, everybody in the family. We take care of the kids when they're in the bio family. Um, and then recently there's also, um, some question. I don't think it was intentional, but the kid, her foster kid, seven months old, he's had failure to thrive, came in with bruising all down his back from the, the foster dad patting him too hard when he was sick with some rhinovirus. So there's like all these complications and messiness. Um, she can't, I think barriers are financial. She's super stressed about finances. Like for some reason they can't afford diapers, but I thought with foster families that you get money to cover that stuff. And I had enough cloth diapers to be able to give her cloth diapers to save money, but, um, she doesn't want the smell of the cloth diapers. And I don't think they could honestly keep up with the laundry anyways, but like, I'm just, I don't know how to make her feel better. I think some of it is psych stuff, but like, I can't make her take meds. I can't make her do therapy. And we have a long, long pregnancy to go. I mean, she's 10 weeks and the baby's not even born yet. And I'm already having PTSD and I want to buy her a snoo bassinet and totally <laughs> inappropriate clinical stuff. But like, <laughs> I was going to say that, that you and her might have PTSD, you know, from the situation with the first pregnancy, you know, mm -hmm. it sounds pretty traumatic. Yeah. She's, um, what, 28, um, or 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. just turned 30. Yeah. And how, how depressed is she? How, how is her depression? Um, she's very depressed. Um, so I will sit down with her, um, cause I've had a you know, pretty good office relationship. And then I run a couple support groups 
um, that she has come into for a foster parent support group. And, um, and then I'll, I do the pregnancy, some of the pregnancy visits and I asked her some of the harder questions and some of those, and she'll just, she throws up all those barriers, like we we're discussing, but, and then it's hard to, she won't give you straight answers on different things. So it's, it's kind of hard to know what to believe. But I would say a lot of her stuff is there's some, just some real psych barriers in there and some things that, um, I just don't, I'm just, just kind of like how to, how to get through to her. And I don't want to do it in a, I hate to do it in a sneaky way through the foster kids, but I did say to her, cause I was kind of looking back through all her notes. Um, and I mean, she's been talking about how stressful the foster kids are in her home for long past this pregnancy or before this, this current pregnancy. Um, and that was the point of all of her stress that she recently brought to me last week. Um, and I said to her, look, um, is this a reasonable thing that you can do right now to take care of you and this pregnancy? Because it's important, like the things you were just saying in your lecture, um, you know, you know, to, for this baby to grow in a healthy environment and to take care of you. Um, and she just completely collapsed into tears that no, 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 this, that's not possible. You can't take these kids. In fact, she was really upset because we did, you know, call CPS when there was the bruising on the back as a report. Um, I don't think, you know, she didn't know who made that call, but she voiced that she was clearly upset about someone had called and then they may lose the children. Um, and how many, mm -hmm. how many foster kiddos are there? Right now there's two, there's a seven month old and a two year old, um, they're brothers. Um, the, this, they've had all the siblings at certain times of this one family, but they've had this seven month old from the time that he was three days old. Um, and he's had um, failure to thrive and we see him on a daily basis for weight checks. Um, and our patient and her husband, they both work each to, they own a business and they each work two full-time jobs. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting case with lots of different working, what, but. What kind of social support does she have? I mean, they just sound so overwhelmed. They've got these two little ones. Um, they're obviously grieving. She's so pregnant, she they're has, working. Um, so they don't have any immediate family that lives in town. Um, she has her, um, her mom that lives out of town, but will come into town occasionally. Um, and I don't hear Megan talk a whole lot about friends. Um, of course, she does lean on me sometimes to look for um, private foster care for her. Um, or to, um, I mean, I don't know if she has much time for friendships. It's probably a barrier where she'll say, cause she says, she'll say to us, I don't even have time to eat. Cause that's one of her things right now in pregnancy. One of her excuses for, um, the nausea and not staying hydrated is look how stressed I am. Cause I don't have time to eat. She's very much got like the, it reminds me actually of myself <laughs> a couple of years ago, but like the dichotomous thinking of it's either all or nothing. There's like, there's, there's the martyr Mary complex and the like, well, if I can't do that, there's no point. Like, and you just throw your hands up and give up and without therapy, like, I don't know how to get past that. <laughs> Chelsea, what is she hoping to get out of therapy? Do you think? What is she hoping to get out of therapy? Yeah, what are her goals in therapy? Well, see, we can't, we haven't been able to get her to commit to therapy, but I was thinking, um, of, we have her coming in for her, essentially her first OB visit besides what she's come in for, um, some weekly viability checks here. Cause now she's 10 weeks, um, where I, we've sat down and kind of visited with her, um, where I was kind of excited. This was coming up cause I wanted some input, but. I was going to discuss a little bit about 
sitting down and visiting with her because I kind of already set the stage about how important it was going to be to take care of her, but also kind of putting the pressure on a little bit about, you know, um, I don't want to hang the foster kids over her, but I also want to say like, we have to take care of you and this, this pregnancy and this child. Um, and we can't do both things. Um, but maybe we can't, I mean, it, I did tell her, you know, it is, this isn't the first time that we've taken care of a mom with two little kids in the home. And I said, look, this can be done. You know, we can take care of you and we can do it with help. Um, I said, this isn't the first time I said, you're not the only mom that has two kids and is struggling. I said, we can help you through this. Um, but we, you know, we, we are going to need some help here, um, to take care of you. And so I was, you know, like to do both of these things, um, can we help you with some therapy? Um, is kind of, I mean, I hate to kind of hang that over a little bit, but I don't know. I kind of, I feel like some. So the only thing we kind of have on her is somewhat of the foster situation. <laughs> and I, I think, don't know if that's fair or not. I think some, you know, as much as I don't, I have my reservations about CPS, you know, sometimes when they are involved, it creates like a, like the, the parent feels like this, uh, it's encouraged to do things well, you know, because they want to keep the child, you know. So if CPS says you have to go to therapy, you know, you have to participate in treatment, you know, I think that will be very helpful. The other thing I wanted to say, I think Prozac is a great medication for her if she's not taking it every day. And there is a weekly Prozac. So maybe she will agree to take it once a week. You know, I could get her to do that. I didn't realize there was a weekly one. With yeah, I, us I usually don't use it. I don't have much experience using it, but I just, I just remember there was, you know, and I thought this is a perfect case to use a weekly Prozac. Like first, it, it will expensive? be good. I don't know. I'm going to check, but like it's to understand first why she doesn't take her medication. What gets in in the way of taking the pill? You know. I like Prozac in her case because usually it doesn't have much withdrawal because it's a long acting. So if she doesn't take it every day, it's okay in that sense. You won't feel sick. But so first I would try to figure out why she doesn't take it. Yeah, you know? because she takes her levothyroxine every, every day. day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think it's because last time you know, like I stressed her the importance of staying on it because it will help her carry the term. And so she just takes it in the middle of the night when she gets up to pee. And, and I don't remember what she said when I said, well, why don't you just put your Prozac right next to it and take them together? Those two, you can take yeah. together. Yeah. And I, I don't remember what she said. <laughs> Chelsea, is she on Medicaid? No, no, no. So I know with Montana Medicaid, and I just wondered because she's got CPS involved with Montana Medicaid, they've covered that weekly Prozac before. I think they just needed um, a prior off about like why the weekly and not the daily because it might be a little bit more expensive, but I've had Montana Medicaid patients with it. So I'm, and I feel like insurance in Montana is actually pretty good with that kind of stuff. So it might just need a prior off. Okay, okay. that's good to know. That's a, at least we have an option. It makes me wonder if she, like, I feel like there's this hidden, I feel like there's guilt and shame that's underneath all this, that they, they maybe aren't even aware of themselves that, and, but I can't, I, I just make assumptions, but like, maybe she doesn't want to take it because of something else or it layers, or maybe she doesn't want to take it because she's worried about the baby. That's fine. I can deal with that. Like, I think that I also feel intertwined in this relationship, like normally I would say, I'm really not the best person to take care of you because I feel like you're not going to come forward and say things to me, but there really probably isn't anybody else that she will trust on that level either. May I comment on this? Yeah, yeah please. Can you, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I see a couple of things going on here. One is that by being non-compliant, she keeps you engaged. So she she cultivates mm -hmm. the relationship with her yeah. bad behavior. 
Secondly, I have a real concern for a seven month old and a two year old. It, and she yeah. sounds so unstable that I'm wondering that those kids should be out of there. I don't, they don't sound safe to me. Yeah. We've had a, we've had lots of, we've had very serious discussions about that. But We're, it's, but it's still going on. That means yeah. those two babies are paying a price here. Yeah, yeah, we see them. We see, we're seeing that baby daily in our clinic right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. And that, the, so, foster, the foster, the fan, the, like there's an independent investigator. I basically called CPS and said, these kids need to be in a different home, I think. Good. Um, but, but I, the foster, the CPS worker also was there when their kid died. And so there's all these layers there. She said the foster system has an independent investigator and they're, she had a word for it was like a transitional something or other where it sounds like they're trying to pull them from the home, but not necessarily doing it right away because of, I have Money. no idea. Money. Yeah. That, it, that's, that's horrific. So let's pretend that doesn't exist and people care about what happens to these babies, but she's going to do what she's going to do. And she's not bonding to any therapist because she's focused on you. And she's doing this dance to keep you engaged. So um, I don't know, you know, what her background is or, you know, what kind of trauma she has going on, but, but she needs to focus on her and she needs to be sort of backed into a corner where she'll do that. But bottom line is these two babies should not be paying a price for this. So that's my 10 cents worth. Yeah. I, I wonder no, if with this, I'm with, I, sorry. Yeah, this has caused us lots of this is this has been haunting. I wonder if it, you know, also in addition, having those babies at home, it's kind of adding to the, you know, that she can present to you and say, look how busy I am because I have all of these obligations. My plate is full. So I wonder if, you know, the kids are removed from this situation. What is she going to present as an excuse? But there's mm -hmm. also a uh, a contradiction there if you've got a baby that's failing to thrive it's not getting attention so if she's busy mm -hmm. she's not busy taking care of that baby i will correct that so the, the kid was yeah. pulled by a home for failure to thrive and then gained a lot of weight in their care and was doing great until the kid they, he goes to daycare so you know within two weeks of being in daycare had rhinovirus and then you know was up all night and then it took me a little bit was doing okay he's got eating he's got a high palate so he takes 22 calorie he's also got milk protein and so protein intolerance and then he got that and started vomiting up the formula and so they would come in and actually i had when he was gaining weight i told him they could go come in once a week instead of every day and the the foster father was like no i'm not comfortable with that we're bringing him in at least two times a week um and then recently the kid developed an ear infection and now that that's treated the kid is gaining weight and like the kid looks good in their care. The kid is happy mm -hmm. and threat. It's a totally different situation, but like a thousand times better than the bio parents, but still mm -hmm. not like, I, I he's think challenging. he's challenging. Cha yeah. It's just a different medical situation. I think if he were, yeah, yeah, it's complicated. Is, is the seven month old, um, reminding her of the, the, uh, infant death is the seven you month old know. is you that kind of like paying a price on that yeah i i kind of wonder about that being some kind of a uh dependent transference yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and she'll do so the other thing that was interesting she had she has hyperemesis and she'll come in for iv fluid like i'll give her iv fluids and then it took till the end of the day and when they handed her off to a new nurse the new nurse is like oh she's had two sandwiches today and just ordered a third I was like, good God, she should have been home four hours ago, but she chose to stay to finish off the fluids. And I was like, why would you not go home to those babies at home or your husband is struggling with them? Like, why would you? And then it dawned on me, Chelsea said her mom had come from Billings to stay with them. So she knew the kids were safe and were getting tons of care from the, and I think she just wanted a break, a mental break from the chaos. She really needs psychotherapy. She does. She definitely really does. Badly. And well, really badly. Really needs to deal with the loss they never so, i don't she never they never got the help they needed from the loss they did like they did no, counseling okay. with somebody that really helped them out with the like i was impressed by how mature they handled it and they did really really well for about six to nine months 
And then it's been since, honestly, since they've been in foster care, I think there's a lot of resentment that builds up when you take care of like your friend's kid that they can't feed and, and all the other, I think, and then getting pregnant and having a miscarriage. I think that's when everything fell apart. Yeah. And I would agree with Dr. Frieder. I mean, I definitely see the new therapy and I wonder if they're really resistant to the individual piece, if she would be open to some, like, some group therapy or group support or even some like social support sometimes there is a lot of um just stigma you know and I wonder if that's you know what's the meds too is there like a mental health stigma going on but if she was involved in even some kind of like support group with other mamas like foster care moms or you know pregnancy loss or even just pregnant mamas if that would um if that'd be something she'd want to get into and then just real quick I know we're almost out of time there's a couple options for like diapers in Billings. So if her mom lives in Billings, um, Family Promise has a mobile diaper bank and they go around. Um, and then United Way has a diaper bank as well. And so they just, mom just needs to show up, say what size diapers they need and they'll get diapers and wipes for free. Is there also some psychotherapy? Like, I feel like, I mean, we have good counselors locally and we have a couple social workers, but I really need, um, she really needs trauma informed, like somebody specialized in trauma and somebody specialized in postpartum and pregnancy stuff. And I don't know where to send her or how to get her connected to that. So Chelsea, if you, I'll put my email in the chat. If you email me, um, I can either try to get her connected. I'm actually um, a therapist mm -hmm. in Billings. So there's a lot of therapists doing telehealth now. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, we have a handful of perinatal specialists across the state and a lot of them too are like EMDR trained. And so I think a combination of a perinatal therapist and a trauma informed therapist, you know, and I guess one of the beauties of, of um, COVID is that all of us are doing telehealth too. So, so I'll email you and, um, or email me and I can get you some names. Okay, awesome. One of the things that, that um, you, you can't lose track of is while you're all putting out these really good ideas, and all putting out information that is very helpful. She's not latching on to any of it. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. running her agenda and you can keep offering, you can keep working, but you're working harder than she's working. So, so <laughs> until, <laughs> she wants, until she wants to step up and take care of herself, she, you, your efforts are gonna be kind of fruitless but yeah. more than more than anything, she's she's attached to the medical team, and that's where she's attaching, not to a group, not to a therapist. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if she's so busy that that she can't eat, I don't see her going to a group or or sitting down and doing that. She she does need some serious help and some serious redirection. Maybe she won't do that as long as she has the excuse of these two babies. Can I, so I have a reputation of being pretty blunt. I think if, if it were, I mean, I can basically say, look, you can't, you have to do this by the next time I see you, if you don't have an appointment, like, I don't know what sort of like dangling care I can provide, but I, I think I have enough of a relationship where I'm going to say, this is your job. This, you have to do this. Um, that's, that's true. And you could do that. But I think the suggestion that CPS put put the threat to her right. mm -hmm. is probably going to be a little more powerful. Okay. She'll, she'll, go along, she'll go along with you for a couple of weeks or three weeks and then she'll blow you off again. Yeah. And I was going to yeah, say, if there's a CPS involvement, then um, they usually will pay for counseling services too. So she, she doesn't yeah. have to worry about that if it's, you know, it's not coming out of her pocket. So that might be another kind of okay. thing that you can use. That's good to know. I didn't know that. Yeah. The other thing I think before we stop is that she needs a psychiatric evaluation to see really what symptoms she has and what her diagnosis and to see if there is anything else going on that needs to be treated, you know, even with medication. Yeah, her. C C CPS will probably be the big yeah. guns to do that. Yeah. And, and that's what it's, that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for presenting this case. It was a great case. And yes, thanks for her. all your input on that. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
Thanks, so everyone. Nice to see Thank everyone. You. And see you in two weeks. Bye. Sounds good. <laughs>